Let's go. Okay, thanks to Hannah and, and the Mass Organising Committee for um, inviting me to give this, this webinar today, uh, which is on the wider implications um, of climate-driven shifts in kelp forest structure. Okay, so the global ocean covers 70% of the Earth's surface and represents about 90% of the biosphere and supports about 50% of global primary productivity and over 2 million species. The oceans provide 30% of animal protein used by humans and in doing so sustain about a billion people. And the oceans obviously support a range of ecosystem services. But the continued provision of these ecosystem services is threatened by a range of anthropogenic stressors, um, including uh, coastal development, overfishing, the input, inputs of nutrients and sediments into coastal waters, the spread of invasive species, uh, plastic pollution, ocean warming, uh, increased storminess and ocean acidification. And really the underlying cause of these stresses is an ever increasing human population, which is now approaching uh, 8 billion. And as a research community and a society, we've really put a lot of effort uh, and focus on a couple of these stresses in, in recent years. Um, for the last couple of decades, there's been a lot of work on ocean acidification. Really the general impact is that OA will impact some taxa in some regions, and particularly by towards the end of the century. Similarly, there's been a lot of work on plastic pollution, uh, which is an important stressor that does impact um, some taxa in some regions, but there's limited evidence that plastic pollution could lead to loss of entire ecosystem functioning. Um, I would argue that the most, one of the most pervasive stressors to global marine ecosystems uh, is recent rapid ocean warming, which will continue um, through this century. So this map just shows uh, the rate of change of temperature uh, in coastal waters around the world. And the point is that most coastal waters are red or dark red, which show that they've um, warmed significantly uh, in recent decades. And these recent warming trends have been linked with a range of ecological responses or impacts, um, in particular species rain shifts, where species have moved their latitudinal distributions polewards primarily, um, loss of, of a direct loss of habitat and associated biodiversity, widespread coral bleaching and mortality, uh, mass mortality events of finfish and other important species, and the spread of non-native invasives, and also an increased occurrence of harmful algal blooms and disease. Um, our team works primarily on habitat forming large brown seaweeds, which I'll come, I'll come back to in more detail. But just to show that um, the distribution and, and population structure of these species is strongly influenced by sea temperature. And as sea temperatures have changed, so too um, have population structure and distributions of many of these habitat formers around the world. And I'll come back into that uh, in more detail. Um, so Hannah's encouraged me to embrace technology. Uh, and so we're gonna try and do a poll uh, before I sort of go directly um, into kelp forest ecology and actually get, uh, get an idea from you guys what, what kelp actually is. Um, it may not be uh, as straightforward um, as you might think. So what actually is kelp? Is it A, any brown seaweed? B, a large brown canopy forming seaweed? Species belonging to the order laminarials or a large plant-like plant -like stage of species belonging to the Phyophyceae? We'll just keep that going for a few more seconds. Oh, this is quite good. Okay, brilliant. Uh, really interesting results. So um, that's the end of the poll. It worked really well. Uh, and 52% of those who voted said that species belonging to the order laminarials. Interestingly, quite a lot of you said large brown canopy forming seaweeds. And if we move on to the next slide, you're basically both right. Um, so what is kelp? Taxonom taxonomically and strictly speaking, it is indeed uh, a species belonging to the order Laminarialis. And so most of you were right. But however, I'd say that a lot of ecologists, myself included, we use a kind of slightly broader definition that includes uh, many large brown canopy forming seaweeds that also belong to other taxonomic groups such as fucoids. Uh, most kelps have a biphasic life cycle with a microscopic gametophyte stage and a macroscopic sporophyte phase. Um, the sporophyte is kind of this plant-like structure uh, that you're probably familiar with. But I think when you say to kelp to most people, they think of uh, rotting seaweed um, on the beach, stinking out the place. 
Hopefully I'll convince you that it's more important than that. Uh, and we're gonna move on to a second poll before I talk about kelps globally. So how many species of true kelp have been described on earth? Uh, we'll start that poll now. And the options are 50, 70, 90, or 110. So if you get your vote in um, promptly. Okay, the results are in um, and it's quite an even split, but 43% of those who voted went for 70 species of kelp on earth. Okay, and the big reveal, uh, there's actually about 112 species. This is from um, John Bolton's review, sorry, it's not cited here, uh, represented by 33 genera or so. And the point is they're geographically very widespread. So these are just some of the major genera. And uh, actually kelps are predicted to inhabit around 25% of the world's coastlines. So they really are widespread, particularly in um, temperate regions uh, and now um, sort of into Arctic coastlines. Kelps are also really important. They're hugely productive. So, so they're some of the fastest growing primary producers on earth. Uh, and this primary productivity is really important for inshore food webs, may be consumed directly by grazers, or actually most um, kelp organic matter is processed through uh, detrital food webs. And kelps are foundation species, so similar to how trees on land um, alter the environment for local organisms uh, and provide biogenic structure, kelps do the same, and in doing so they can elevate local um, levels of biodiversity. In terms of direct habitat provision, they do this uh, in a few different ways. So the holdfast is like the, the root-like structure that basically just anchors the plant to the reef. And the morphology, structure, and size um, of these holdfast really varies a lot between species and even populations. But on the whole, they provide really high quality um, protective habitat, lots of internal living space um, for a whole heap of, of organisms, uh, mostly mobile invertebrates, but other stuff as well. And the stipe structure, which is a sort of thing akin to a stem, uh, provides a lot of surface area for colonization, um, mostly by red algae, uh, and also sessile, sessile invertebrates, such as the sponge you can see here. And um, this secondary habitat provides uh, a lot of space, living space for, again, mobile invertebrates, things like amphipods, polychaetes and gastropods, really important prey items for fish. And um, I should just acknowledge and thank Richard Shucksmith, who's up in Shetland for some of these images that I'm gonna show in a second. Uh, it's really fantastic um, visual it, uh, projections of how, how these kelp forests actually look in, in great conditions. And uh, when you have lots of stipes together or plants together, you have a kelp stand or forest, and you can see that the, the kelp canopy is really altering conditions underneath in terms of light and water flow and facilitating these different organisms. This is an image looking across the canopy, over the canopy, you can see the individual blades of the plants, which are like the large leaf-like photosynthetic area. And you can see that these habitats can be really um, extensive and vast. So a single kelp holdfast may support uh, more than 50 species and a single kelp plant uh, may support in excess of 80,000 individual um, animals, mobile invertebrates. And kelp forests are critical foraging and nursery habitat for fish, shellfish, mammals and birds. And again, just to show this visually, I think these were all taken from near Shetland, you can see these juvenile fish um, using the kelp canopy. And obviously they're important foraging grounds for some of the larger cuddlier charismatic megafauna, um, which are enjoying using the habitat. And uh, kelps are also um, provide other ecosystem services such as biogenic coastal defense, nutrient cycling and, and blue carbon, which I'll come back to um, later. So really our work, the work of our team here at the MBA and also our network of international collaborators, we're kind of interested in how contemporary stresses, things like warming, uh, extreme storm events, processes acting across the land sea interface uh, and the spread um, of invasive species can affect the structure and biodiversity of these habitats, which in turn affects their functioning and the services that they provide. But it's clear that kelp populations and the ecosystems they underpin are structured by many processes that operate over different spatial and temporal scales. And it's also clear that some of these contemporary stresses can and do alter the structure and functioning of these systems and therefore the goods and services that they can provide. So hopefully in that sort of kelpie introduction, I've convinced you guys out there that um, these are important habitats globally. 
But over the past sort of few decades, there have been a number of reports of, of widespread deforestation from different regions. And the drivers, the causes of these de deforestation events um, vary. Some of them can be more natural, things like episodic sea urchin outbreaks leading to overgrazing and sea urchin barrens. But others have a more anthropogenic signal. And I'm going to just talk about three examples of, of loss or change um, as case studies to, to examine the effects of ocean warming. So the first case study comes from um, Western Australia. And about a decade ago, I was lucky enough to be doing my postdoc uh, in, in Perth. And when I was there during this time, the west coast of Australia experienced the highest magnitude warming event on record. So this marine heat wave happened during summer when sea temperatures were high anyway. And the sea temperatures recorded um, during the at the time were the highest on record, uh, both when we looked at the short-term satellite-derived sea surface temperature data set, but also the longer-term reconstructed data set. And these temperatures were in some places five or even six degrees higher above the long-term average. And this marine heat wave um, was really extensive. It affected over 2,000 kilometers of coastline and also lasted for 10 to 12 weeks. So it was really extreme uh, in a lot of ways. And we were examining, uh, we were working on um, kelp forests on reefs near Perth at the time. And uh, Thomas Wernberg in particular collected a lot of baseline data, which we were able to use to try and detect the effects of this marine heat wave. And essentially before the marine heat wave, um, this kelp colonia radiata covered so 80 to 90% of the reef surface. However, the temperatures became really stressful for this cold temperate species, uh, which began to senesce, lose biomass and, and couldn't maintain the canopy uh, following the heat wave. The loss of the kelp led to loss of, um, of organisms that are facilitated by it, such as some sessile animals, sponges, and also encrusting coral and algae. And what happened very quickly is that opportunistic uh, weedy turf forming algae was able to come in and colonize these gaps in the canopy. So we saw um, around Perth quite a, a marked decline in the canopy cover and an increase um, in turf forming weeds. When we looked further north, things were even more dramatic. So at the sort of warm limit of this species distribution, even before the heat wave, it did cover the vast majority of rocky reef surface and form this sort of complex uh, habitat. But after the heat wave, this species of, of kelp was eradicated from around 100 kilometers of coastline. And in its wake was left this kind of degraded reef state with low um, productivity and low um, complexity. And we, we followed up um, surveying these reefs after the marine heat wave and did some additional surveys up and down the coast. And we were able to publish, publish this paper in, in Science in 2016 because it showed how quickly climate change can drive a rate, climate can drive a regime shift um, of a temperate marine ecosystem. We showed that this kelp was eradicated from 100 kilometers of coastline, that 43% of forests were lost or severely decimated, which was an area of loss of almost 1,000 square kilometers. And in almost all cases, this biogenically complex, biogenic complex habitat was replaced by simple unstructured algal turfs uh, on the reef. We didn't just survey the kelp itself, we looked at associated uh, diversity, things like mobile invertebrates, corals, seaweeds, and fish within the kelp forest. And each of these bars represents a different species, but the red bars are tropical, warm adapted species, and the blue ones are more temperate and um, cold adapted. And across, pretty much across the board, we saw an increase in the abundance of warm water species and a decrease in cold adapted species. When you pull those together, uh, it led to this really rapid um, ecosystem level reconfiguration. So in summary to the marine heat wave, we saw a massive loss of habitat forming seaweeds and their associated herbivores. We also saw some coral bleaching and mortality, um, particularly a bit further north. Uh, we observed a rapid increase in the cover of weedy opportunistic seaweeds uh, and also warm water fish. And following the marine heat wave, there's been a clear increase in coral recruitment, um, particularly in areas that were once um, kelp forest. So it's kind of clear that this extreme warming event altered the structure of an entire temperate ecosystem and caused a really rapid phase shift towards a more tropicalized state. And this marine heat wave really um, provides like a large scale natural experiment to see whether kelp forests can recover. And we're uh, basically a decade after the event and there's very limited ev evidence of recovery or whether what we're actually seeing is rapid tropicalization. <clears throat> 
And we'll be able to see whether these um, changes in structure cas cascade through to ecosystem services, such as fisheries. But it's clear that warming can drive um, widespread loss of, of algal forests. Okay, so the second case study uh, comes from Japan. Interestingly, in, in Japan, they have this term isiyake, which the fishermen have been using for centuries, which refers to periods when um, the, the, the extent, the cover of, of seaweed forests, of algal forests is reduced. And they know that during these times of low algal cover, they can expect some fisheries to be impacted. Anyway, in the southwest of Japan, they've seen a steady increase in, in, in sea temperature over recent decades. Oh, sorry. And uh, they've seen some um, quite, uh, quite remarkable responses, responses of seaweed forests um, to this warming event, so this warming trend, sorry. So in, the, in this bay in the 70s and 80s, uh, it tended to be dominated or characterized by a few different species of temperate cold water sargassum, which provided algal forest. However, over time, these cold water species contracted their range and declined uh, as temperatures became too stressful. And instead, we had this uh, increase or influx of, of a warm adapted tropical species of sargassum, which has come in, but only sort of partially um, replaced the cold water species. So this so steady warming has caused mass die off and retreat of cold water species, both kelps, colonia carver, and also temperate sargassum, and has only been partially replaced by warm tolerant tropical species. However, there's also been an indirect effect of warming because they've seen an inc increase in the abundance and grazing rates of tropical herbivorous fish. Now these fish graze the reef like mad and actually suppress any recovery. And so they, the overgrazing has facilitated a tropicalization from these luscious temperate macroalgal beds to these reefs dominated by sparse beds of tropical thermoresistant sargassum and grazer resistant algae and coral. And all in all, uh, several thousands of hectares of algal bed have been lost, um, which has major implications for both fisheries and biodiversity. Just to show that um, through a series of images, this is some work we did with Adriana Verges a few years ago now, but this is um, the same site photographed over around 22 years or so. And it's really quite stark to see this rapid tropicalization in response to warming. So in the early 90s, these reefs were dominated by a high cover of Aclonia carver. Uh, this became sparse as um, it got uh, negatively impacted by warming and also started to get overgrazed um, by tropical herbivorous fish. This was then replaced by uh, sort of grazer resistant encrusting coralline algae. And then over time, transitioned towards this hard coral tropicalized state. So in response to warming, these, um, these, these coastal habitats can tropicalize really, really quite quickly. Okay, the third case study um, focuses on the Northeast Atlantic, which is an area most of us are probably more familiar with. And there's been a number of reports of uh, deforestation from around of the Northeast Atlantic in recent decades. So for example, overgrazing by sea urchins in Norway has led to loss of uh, large scale kelp forests. And further south, loss of sugar kelp has been attributed to increased nutrients and temperate and te increased nutrients and temperature. And then further south again on the Iberian Peninsula in both Spain and Portugal, uh, there have been a number of reports of, of loss of kelp forests, macroalgal beds and a number of different species um, which have um, contracted their range or declined in abundance in response to recent uh, warming trends. But I'm going to focus on some um, more subtle responses that we've been observing and working on in the UK. Uh, and just to put our, our system into some context, <clears throat> kelps are found along around 12,000 kilometres of UK coastline, depends how you measure it. And they're found from sort of the low intertidal, say one metre above chart datum, to depths um, of around 40 meters uh, in really clear waters. And the total aerial extent of these kelp populations estimates range from 9,000 to 19,000 square kilometers. And the total standing stock of kelp biomass may be around 20 million tons of fresh weight. So they're big numbers and just to put them into some context, um, the upper estimates for, for, for aerial extent would be around 30 times the area of salt marshes in the UK around 200 times um, the, the area of seagrass meadows, around about the same um, aerial extent as broadleaf forests on land, 
uh, and about the same area as Wales, which um, a lot of things seem to be. And in terms of standing stock biomass, uh, the total um, biomass of kelps is around four times the annual harvest of potatoes in the UK. So there's some serious um, biomass and some serious spatial extent of these kelp forests. And we know that there are several factors that, that, that really drive or influence the structure and the distribution of these habitats and these populations. So we know the temperature, uh, exposure to waves and light availability are kind of key factors in determining the distribution of these species. And other things like availability of uh, rocky substrate and, and local factors like nutrients and tidal flows and, and grazing and competition can be important. Uh, and if, if you chuck all these factors together, you can actually predict the distribution biomass and abundance of these species around the UK. And uh, Mike Burrows at SAMS has done some really excellent work recently trying to develop these models. Um, just before I go on, the third and final poll uh, of the talk, um, I wanted to ask the audience how many kelp species uh, are actually found in our waters. And I'm talking mainland here, not overseas territories. And we've gone for two, four, seven or 10. Okay, thanks, Hannah. Yeah, so the poll results, um, most people, 52% said that there are seven species of kelp in the UK. Uh, and I can reveal that you're a very informed uh, audience because we, we do actually have the coexistence um, of seven different species in our waters. Uh, and that includes Saccharides polychides, which technically isn't a true kelp, but we tend to include it in that definition. Uh, and <laughs> interesting, we have a really interesting system, quite a cool system because each of those seven species can be locally dominant under different conditions. But we know that based on their thermal tolerances and their latitudinal distributions, that we can expect some of these species to actually decline uh, in abundance in response to increased temperature to seawater warming. Um, some of these may even contract their range northwards through, um, through the UK in, in the coming years. On the other hand, we have a couple of more warm adapted southerly species, and these are predicted to increase in abundance, proliferate under warmer conditions, uh, and in the case of the golden kelp actually extend its range further north over time. And then we also have uh, this uh, non-native species, this invasive, the Asian kelp or wakami and area, uh, which we can expect to locally increase as it sort of um, spills out from artificial habitats into natural habitats. So I'm just gonna talk about some work that's focused on a couple of these species. Uh, first of all, it was done mostly by Harry Teagle as part of his PhD. And these species are Laminaria hyperborea, which is the, the cold water dominant along most of the wave exposed uh, North Atlantic, Northeast Atlantic coastline. And this is a very northerly species distributed from northern Norway and Iceland down. And there's still some populations left on the Iberian Peninsula, although uh, they're becoming quite sparse. On the other hand, we have the golden kelp Laminaria ocreluca, which is very similar in its morphology and its structure, but very different in its distribution. It's kind of warm adapted. It's found from Morocco, I'm oh, sorry, Morocco and the Mediterranean up through um, to Southwest uh, England. Well, in, it was first discovered in, or observed in Southwest England in Plymouth in 1948. And then in the seventies, it was observed, uh, recorded off Lundy. And actually interestingly now in the last few years, it's been found um, off the West coast of Ireland. And species distribution models would predict that this species will continue to advance polewards, northwards uh, with, with predicted warming trends through the next few decades. So Harry and I were interested in whether there's any evidence to show that this warm adapted species is proliferating towards its range edge uh, relative to the more cold um, assemblage dominant. And unfortunately there aren't many good historical baseline data sets in the UK to have a look at this, but we're able to pull out some uh, monitoring reports from some different locations in Southwest England uh, namely Lundy Island, the Scillies and Plymouth Sound. And we showed that in all these cases, the relative abundance of this warm adapted golden kelp has indeed increased uh, in recent years. So that aligns with predictions from increased temperature. So the next question is, okay, so if we've seen a greater abundance of one species, does that actually matter for the structure and the functioning of the community? Uh, and Harry did some excellent biodiversity work to look at how much 
look at the structure and the richness of the communities directly associated with these two different habitat formers. And um, without going into the data in any detail, just to say that yes, these two warm and cold kelp species do differ massively in the communities that they support and the levels of local biodiversity. So this is a typical cold water laminaria hyperborea, and it always supports a rich and abundant epiphytic assemblage of red algae and, 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 and sessile invertebrates, which in turn provide secondary habitat for a high diversity and richness of mobile invertebrates. However, the, um, the warm water, the warm adapted species, the golden kelp ocreluca, typically supports very low levels of biodiversity directly associated with, with the kelp itself. It has this um, clean stipe and blade, which is devoid of, of epiphytic life. Uh, and so actual levels of richness are quite low um, compared to, to hyperborea. So if we, in some sites we're seeing this replacement of one with the other, we may expect local diversity, at least directly associated with the plant itself to decline. Uh, as part of um, Albert Pesarodono's uh, MRES project, we also looked at whether these two different species have different rates or timings of, of growth, of biomass accumulation and release. And we did this at a couple of populations near Plymouth uh, using the classic hole punch method where you can basically see how much the blade of a kelp extends over a set period of time. And um, this shows the biomass accumulation, the amount of, uh, of biomass um, accumulated to the blade and this on the right it shows the amount of detritus that's released at different months during the year. And for hyperborea, the cold kelp, we can see that uh, growth rates increase dramatically into spring and then basically turn off uh, by early summer and are very low through the rest of the year. Uh, and similarly, it releases tons of um, detritus in a pulse uh, in late spring and then not much through the year. However, the warm species Ocreluca has a very different strategy where it increases its growth rates through spring, peaks in summer and maintains some level of growth through the year. And similarly, it releases its detritus uh, much later in the year. So if the community is, contains detritivores that rely on this, this pulse of energy, then the timing uh, and the magnitude of that may differ with a species replacement. We also looked at how these two different species may be consumed by grazers um, differently and um, we looked at the density of two key grazers, the, the, the blue red limpet and also the top shell. And we looked at the density of these grazers on the two different host kelp species uh, throughout the year at a couple of sites and basically found um, consistently higher densities on Ocreluca, the warm species, than the cold. Albert ran some feeding trials and again showed that Ocreluca, this warm species, was preferentially consumed and um, we also did some classic detritus litter bag experiments where we chucked the two different species into some uh, uh, subtitle habitats and examined in situ um, rates of decomposition and again found that this warm species is more quickly consumed and recycled than the cold. So what does it all mean? Basically, we don't know, <laughs> there's still a lot of unknowns, but if we do move in some sites from a system that's more dominated by the cold hyperborea towards the warm adapted Ocreluca, we may see some differences in the way um, these plants grow and are consumed by uh, associated organisms. We can perhaps uh, expect higher rates of in-situ grazing uh, and different timings and release of organic matter, which may be turned over and recycled more quickly uh, in an Ocreluca dominated system. But basically warming is driving subtle but important changes in UK kelp forest structure. And it's clear that a warm adapted species supports less diversity and exhibits different rates and timings of production. The wider implications remain poorly understood. But it's a useful case study um, of climate change impacts in our seas. Okay, I just wanted to touch on some science that uh, we've been doing um, around Scotland as well. And all this work I'm gonna describe is done in collaboration with Professor Pippa Moore, who's now at Newcastle. And we wanted to know how much carbon is actually taken in and assimilated and transferred through these kelp habitats. And critically, what environmental factors influence these rates of biomass accumulation and, and release. And to do this, some time ago in 2014, we set up eight long-term study sites uh, distributed along the UK coast. So we had two northerly regions, uh, North Scotland near Orkney and West Scotland near Oban. And then further south, we have a couple of sites in Pembrokeshire and Wales, and then some near Plymouth in southwest England. And the idea being is that along this latitudinal gradient, uh, we have these cold, um, cold locations, 
which are actually on average around two and a half degrees colder than these more southerly warmer locations. So we can start to tentatively look at the effects of ocean climate on some of these processes. Um, and at all of these sites, we tagged uh, loads of plants, like up to over 400 individual laminar hyperborea plants. This was were all tagged, whole punched, collected, and then, uh, and then subsequently collected and measured. Um, we took thousands of biomass values and uh, tagged over a thousand individual plants to look at dislodgement rates um, at different times of the year. Uh, and essentially what we found is um, this A and B plots here are just different methods to estimate primary productivity or biomass accumulation. And in both cases, the, our cold sites in, in, in north of the UK were much more productive um, than the warmer sites, about twice as productive using the regrowth method. Uh, and we also looked at the standing stock, so the amount of carbon that's locked up any one time in these kelp forests. And in this case, the northern colder kelp forests um, tended to store around three times as much carbon at any one time. And that's really because in these cold, uh, good conditions, also clear waters around Orkney, um, these plants get much bigger than they do um, further south and therefore contain much more biomass and carbon. To look at this slightly differently, um, again, this shows the carbon standing stock as an average of the cold regions and the warm regions. And we also looked at detritus release, so how much carbon per year is released as particular organic matter through detritus. And hyperborea releases it in three different ways. But when we added them up, it was clear that the cold water um, habitats release about twice as much than the warm water ones. And for standing stock and total detritus, there's a negative relationship between water temperature and the amount of carbon stored or released. Although there was, of course, some variability between sites. So this work suggests that standing stock is greater in colder climates for this species and that the release of detritus is negatively related to water temperature. So with warming, we can perhaps expect the amount of carbon held and released by kelp forests in this region to decline. Now, this is important for a number of reasons, partly because a lot of detritivores and other organisms rely on this detrital material. But also, there's increasing interest in whether um, this carbon is important for long-term natural carbon sequestration, as in blue carbon. Uh, that's because even if a small fraction of all this vast amount of detritus that's released, if just a small fraction ends up stored for long periods of time, say in deeper offshore waters or sediments or seagrass meadows, then that could be an important contribution to overall blue carbon. But that really much is still work ongoing. Just wanted to sort of finish by saying that um, when, we, when, we, when I started working on, on kelp forests about 12 years ago, it wasn't really, it didn't seem to be anyway, much interest uh, in the general public or mainstream media in these systems. But in the last few years, I think that's really changed. And um, there's a lot more uh, interest and awareness from both the public and government bodies, uh, etc. And I think this is partly due to an increased demand in kelp derived products, which leads to this uh, debate or discussion about whether they should be wild harvested or, or cultivated. Also, there's an interest, as I say, in kelp carbon as being an important donor for blue carbon ecosystem services. And um, there's been some nice case studies about habitat restoration and rewilding of marine environments, uh, particularly from, say, the Help Our Kelp campaign in, in East Sussex. Um, and this is great, but what I'd say is that there's still major knowledge gaps persist that really hinder our ability to address some of these questions uh, and come up with um, reliable uh, and effective management plans. I'm just going to summarise the talk in a couple of slides. Uh, the first summary is perhaps uh, the doom and gloom summary. Um, so <clears throat> there's been significant loss of kelp forest habitat reported from many locations around the world. And the drivers of loss uh, are varied, but include gradual warming, extreme climatic events, eutrophication, decreased water quality, overgrazing, the spread of non-natives and interactions between these stresses. And in general, highly structured, highly diverse and highly productive habitats are replaced by poorly structured habitats that exhibit low diversity and low productivity, at least in the short term. And our work from the UK has shown that substitutions of habitat forming species can have implications for ecological functioning and stru structure and functioning, even if those habitat forming species appear to be uh, morphologically and functionally similar, there may be some knock on effects. And some of these um, changes will have consequences for inshore food webs and fisheries. And also lead to loss of other ecosystem services, 
uh, such as biogenic storm protection, carbon cycling, and human interactions with these habitats. Okay, but we've got a slightly sunnier summary to end with. Um, kelp forests are expanding in many areas around the world. Uh, you can argue whether that's good or bad, but there will be increasing ecosystem service provision in some regions. Kelp forests in many areas, including Scotland, seem to have been stable over time, uh, potentially for many decades, and so far do appear resistant to some envir to environmental change. There's definitely increasing awareness of the importance of kelp forests, which one would hope would lead to potentially better management and conservation. Kelp cultivation is ever growing uh, and could have multiple benefits. There have been some positive localized reports of both kelp restoration uh, and rewilding, and these provide, um, offer some cause for ocean optimism. And so this, there is increasing interest in cultivation, restoration and protection, but major knowledge gaps um, hinder management and conservation efforts and should be the focus of um, a greater research uh, effort going forward. Cool. Well, I hope of, um, that talks of some interest and value, sort of give, us, give you an overview of some of the kelp research that's going on uh, both within our network and elsewhere. Uh, there's tons of people that I'd like to thank over the years that have helped with this work. Um, and I think, uh, yeah, that's it. So I'm happy to take some questions if there are any. Great. Thank you so much, Dan, for that really informative talk really stark um, images that you've shown from some of those case studies and also some fun stats including potatoes <laughs> so that's, that's good. we've had a couple of questions already be submitted so if anyone who's watching this on zoom or youtube want to submit a question please use that q a chat uh, q a box at the bottom of the screen or use the live chat if you're joining us on youtube to submit a question we're going to keep an eye on both of these platforms and don't worry this record this webinar is being recorded as well so if you're not able to stay until the end um, and we don't get you don't get to see your question get answered we're going to try and work through all of these now so done um let's head to the questions that have been submitted um and the first question is, comes in and asks do you consider the okra luca to be an alien species in the uk and i'm gonna just say i'm sorry if i mispronounce any of these names <laughs> uh no we, I, i'd consider it to be a climate change range expander rather than an alien or introduced species and i think there is an ongoing discussion in the literature about how to differentiate between climate driven expanding species or contracting species and uh, more um, discontinuous uh, introduced non native species. So, Ocraluca really, its distribution um, is just expanding continuously into colder waters or what were colder waters further north. So, I wouldn't call it a, an alien species, more of a, a range expander or climate change winner. Thank you. Um, we're going to move on to the second question, which is who is from Charlotte asking, what are the implications of the different growth rates, biomass for algal farming? Should farms look in the south, look to culture um, the uh, aqua luca? That's a really good question. Um, <clears throat> yeah, certainly. Uh, yeah, certainly um, different species grow differently, obviously, under different environmental conditions. And farmers need to look to the future to see which species may continue to grow well uh, under in warmer waters or under slightly different environmental conditions. In answer to the question, uh, they do farm um, Laminaria ocraluca, uh, I believe, further south in Spain and Portugal potentially, and that is a species that could continue to do well uh, in the UK in coming years. I think for now, for the next decade or two, the the, the species that are being farmed, namely sugar kelp, saccharine, and latissima. Uh, and, and potentially laminaria digitata should be uh, okay to, to farm even in the south of the UK. But yeah, certainly going forward, um, the farmers need to consider um, warm improved species. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And um, our next question is from Graham asking, do kelps release lipids with a consequent calming effect on stormy seas? I, I don't know about this. I don't know either. <laughs> uh, uh, yes, kelps do release uh, lipids along with lots of other biochemical compounds, but um, I don't think the concentration would be enough to have a calming effect in stormy waters. But that is a question that's really interesting that I've never seen before. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> 
Uh, no worries, we're getting lots of questions in now, so we're going to work through these. Our next question is from Lars asking, do you think recent dramatic declines, uh, for instance, in Northern California kelp forests, that have recently collapsed will remain in an alternative state for decades to come the same in many other places such as Tasmania do you think we will experience similar dramatic declines in northern Europe well hi Lars yeah great question um yeah there's a lot to unpack there I don't I don't know whether we'll see such dramatic shifts um in northern Europe or whether instead what we'll see is sort of gradual shifts in structure and function um I guess to understand what would happen, we should maybe look further south into warmer waters and just sort of kind of expect the structure of kelp forests around the Iberian Peninsula, for example, to be similar to what we can expect uh, around the UK in the coming decades. So we will potentially see a shift from these long lived kelp species like Laminaria hyperbrea, which can live for 14, 15 years or more, to more uh, warm adapted, faster turnover, uh, younger species either uh, pseudo-annuals or annuals or short-lived species and so what I expect that will happen the actual stability of the habitat becomes much lower so there's faster turnover faster change throughout the year and between years so the whole habitat becomes less stable so I think we'll see that um, interestingly in around the UK and, and in most of northern Europe we don't get massive um, overgrazing by sea urchins which they get in a lot of other places we're in a kind of Goldilocks zone in the UK where we don't have massive um, overgrazing problems by urchins so I can't see rapid phase shifts by urchin grazing happening, um, but we will see a more gradual shift potentially to a less stable habitat structure. Okay, interesting. Thank you for that. Uh, we're going to move on to a question from David asking, um, do you know of any consequences of offshore developments such as wind farms on coastal ecology and kelp distribution? Wow, okay. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know of any papers that have specifically looked at the offshore developments um, on the effects of, of kelp distribution and kelp ecology. Uh, what I would say is that's going to be a lot of, um, potentially a lot of uh, hard substrate that's put in to the middle of the North Sea or wherever that would be uh, a substrate that's suitable for colonisation by seaweeds. Whether that can be linked in with kelp farming, which people have sort of talked about combining those two activities, um, I'm not sure. But certainly I'd imagine that some of those substrates will be colonised which could be good or bad, depending on your point of view. It may provide, for example, a stepping stone for the non-native invasive species um, to go elsewhere, or it could just increase benthic productivity and, uh, and, and um, diversity at sort of local scales offshore. So yeah, I don't, I'm not, that's not a very good answer, but it's such a big question. I don't really know exactly what the consequences would be. Okay, more of a watch the space potentially. Um, we're going to move on to Tanya's question, which has come in um, asking about the uh, if you know of any references for wave dissolution values from kelp farms, uh, from kelp forests. Uh, I think by, so by wave dissolution, do we mean well, uh, wave dampening and buffering by kelp forests? I, I would think so. Yeah. Reduction in significant wave height or. Uh, yeah, that's a, again a really good question. Um, there are very few studies that have directly measured wave attenuation around kelp beds. And the problem is, it's really impossible, it's hard to disentangle between the effect of the rocky reef itself and the effect of the kelp stand on top of the reef in terms of how that affects waves as they hit the shore or, or, or currents as they hit the shore. Um, but there are a couple of papers out there which I'm happy to send over if Tanya wants to email me, I can send them across. Yeah, uh, just to note that obviously uh, Dan's contact details are on the screen right now if anyone has any other kind of questions that they wish to follow up uh, with. So we're going to move on to Claire's question, uh, which asks, presumably kelp restoration in Sussex is intended to promote um, Hyperborea and uh, Digitata. Is Locuria, um, no, Ocubri Ocuruca, likely to move in and supersede these? Uh, this, again, an excellent question. Yeah, so um, the, that, Claire's referring to the Help Our Kelp campaign in Sussex. And there's recently been a bylaw passed that's going to stop trawling uh, within, I think, the first four kilometres of coastline along the Sussex coast. And that's really to promote rewilding of kelp forest habitats in that area. Uh, as to which species will actually um, repopulate that area, I think it is more likely to be Hyperbrea and Digitata in sparse beds, just because um, the, the few kelps that are left in that area, from what they've surveyed so far, does seem to be Hyperbrea and Digitata. 
So initially, at least, I think the source populations are those cold water species, which will initially move in. I think, uh, I don't know where the closest Okraluka population is. I've imagined it would be um, in, in along Dorset somewhere, maybe on the Isle of Wight, I'm not sure. Um, but I would expect over time for Okraluka um, to start to, to move into that area, especially if it's protected enough from waves to allow Okraluka to, to get in and, uh, and start competing with the two northerly species. Mm -hmm. right, I'm gonna take a question that has come in through our chat from Liam, uh, which asks, um, even under severe climate change, subtropical and high latitudes will still have cold winters whilst the tropics don't. Um, is there any idea how this could limit the extent of tropicalization processes? So that's uh, from Liam in our chat. Okay. Um, sorry, I missed the first bit of that question, Hannah. Could you just say that? Yeah, no, 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 no worries. It says, um, even under severe climate change, subtropical and high latitudes will still have cold winters whilst the tropics won't. Any idea how this could limit the extent of tropicalization processes? Yeah. Um, yeah, definitely. I think as there's quite a lot of evidence that shows as warm tropical species um, spread polewards, north or south, depending on your hemisphere, uh, they are definitely sort of cut back by cold winters. And there's quite a few really good examples of how range expansions are sort of stopped in their tracks or even cut back by tens or hundreds of kilometres due to very cold events. And so while we're talking a lot about warming and marine heat waves, these cold snaps or extreme cold events are also really important in range dynamics. So I think, yeah, they're totally right. Um, and we saw with the, um, we've seen with a couple of marine heat wave events in Australia that these warm water fish can come down and they may be okay for a few months, but if it's a cold winter, then they can't overwinter and then their range sort of retracts again. So it's like this sort of um, stepwise process of these warm species expanding polewards and then getting sort of cut back a little bit with a cold winter. But the thing with the Western Australian marine heat wave is that there were subsequent quite warm years, including warm winters, which allowed several fish species to then become established and are still there now. Uh, but yeah, it's a really good question. And, and cold, cold winters certainly do affect range expansions. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting. Um, so you've already touched upon uh, one of the projects that you're, uh, you've mentioned about kelp restoration. Uh, there's been a question asking about just general kelp forest restoration projects in the UK. Do you mind just kind of expanding upon some of the things that you've been involved in or might be aware of happening? So was that in terms of kelp forest restoration? Yes. Yeah, so the main um, kelp forest restoration project in the UK is really around this Help Our Kelp campaign in, in Sussex, which has got quite a lot of media attention recently. There are some smaller scale trials and experiments looking at different techniques of reseeding areas that probably were kelp forests in the past, but now aren't due to like local stresses. Uh, and one, one particular um, technique is called green gravel, where you can actually seed bits of gravel or pebbles or cobbles with baby kelps and then plant them out into areas that used to have kelp forests, but, um, and hopefully they can then settle and, and, and eventually become reproductive and seed that area. So there's some work going on uh, at Newcastle University with, with Pippa Moore looking at green gravel and other restoration techniques. Apart from that, most of the restoration work is kind of elsewhere in the world. Um, there's a lot going on uh, in Sydney and, uh, and in Perth, um, various restoration projects. And there's some work now going on uh, in, in Chile, in Chile particularly, where harvesting of wild kelp has led to large gaps in kelp forest habitat. And they're looking at ways to potentially restore or reseed or rewild some of those habitats. So there's, there's not, it's not like coral restoration where there's tons of projects all over the world, but there are a few hotspots of kelp rest restoration work. And there's, I'd refer the, the I'd refer the, whoever asked the comment that to, there's a couple of really nice meta-analyses coming out on kelp forest restoration, um, which would point them in the right direction. Yeah, but as you said earlier, you know, this, this uh, era of science is really expanding. Uh, you know, there's a lot more interest in it now, both publicly and scientifically. So it, it, it's good to see that this is this work's happening all around the world and not just not just in the UK. So our next question is from Alejandra asking, do you think the density of the kelp individuals in the forest might have an impact on how well they respond to events such as heat waves? For example, a forest that has never been manipulated versus one that has been partially harvested. Yes, absolutely. Um, the density and, and population structure in general uh, will have a major influence on how resilient these 
these habitats are to disturbance events like marine heat waves and like uh, wild harvesting or trawling. And I think work from Norway has shown that where they do actually wild harvest many, many tons of wild kelp for, for alginate for the, for the, for the fishery, um, they've shown that in places where you have a high density of juveniles underneath the canopy, they can respond and recover more quickly than areas which potentially have a lower density of juveniles because you've got this with the small juveniles under the canopy, they're just kind of waiting to grow quickly once the light and the resources become available. So if you've got a decent stock of juveniles, they can uh, increase recovery rates, uh, at least initially. Um, marine heat waves are different, I guess, because it depends how susceptible uh, the whole population is um, to that warming event. But again, some work from Western Australia has shown that there's actual variability within a population uh, about susceptibility to, to extreme temperatures. And there may be some sort of local scale adaptation going on. Uh, so yeah, population dynamics will make a huge difference. Okay, um, actually talking of um, uh, sea warming, our next question is from David asking, when uh, a warming event is detected in sea surface temperature, does it reliably represent what is happening nearer the seabed? Yeah, good question. Uh, we've, done, we've done some work on this many years ago, but there's lots of teams actually now that have had a look at where the sea surface temperatures from satellites accurately represent temperatures experienced on the seabed um, by organisms that live there. So we had some um, in situ loggers installed at 10 or five meters depth and compared those directly with satellite derived SSTs. Uh, and in our work, which was done um, both locally here in Plymouth, but also in Western Australia, we showed but overall, satellite-derived SSTs are really accurate for um, predicting or estimating temperature at the seabed. And that's because our system's really well mixed. We don't really have like uh, thermoclines or stratification events so much. So within just sort of the upper, say, 10, 20 meters, they were pretty good. They did, however, under-detect really extreme uh, short-term variability, like really uh, sort of these sort of weird um, warming events that happen over hours or days were sometimes missed by the satellite-derived SSTs. So I think uh, in situ loggers are better because they detect small scale variability, uh, small, sorry, temporal variability much better. Um, but if you don't have those, and let's face it, it's really hard to put, to put temperature loggers out at all your study sites, then I think satellite derived SSTs are, are, are a really good second best and will give you a good idea uh, of the thermal conditions there. Great, thank you so much for answering that, Dan. We've got a couple of questions to work through so that are still left. So um, it looks like we're gonna be head, uh, just finishing pretty much on time. So uh, I'm gonna to head to Mary Ann's question, which asks, are there any guidelines on establishing kelp farms in areas with naturally low kelp presence to avoid any negative impacts? Uh Sorry, I missed the start of that again. Can you just do that again? <laughs> so this question is from Marianne, and uh, they're asking, are there any guidelines on establishing kelp, for, for kelp farms in areas where there is naturally low kelp presence? So in order to prevent any negative impacts, are there any guidelines? Oh, okay, uh, yeah, good question. And that's, um, funny enough, something that my team's been working on recently for a contract for um, Natural England and NRW who are having more and more queries about setting up kelp farms and more requests um, for how to go about it. And obviously the wider implications and impacts of these, these farms is, is quite poorly understood because um, there are hardly any farms established. So it's very hard um, to get information on their actual environmental impact. Um, but these guidelines uh, will come out and there's also guidelines um, just recently published by the Sustainable Inshore Fisheries Trust, who are based in Scotland, who have just released this really wonderful document, actually, that talks about community kelp farming and some of the impacts and some of the considerations about uh, where those operations might take place. So I think that SIFT, SIFT report is a really good thing to, to check out. Yeah, and um, if, if you pass me the link down, we can always include like some of these links that you've uh, mentioned as well about uh, some reports it, along with the recording. So that if anyone's interested in following up with some of the information you provided, then we can provide links to that as well. Uh, we're going to move on to what looks like our final question. Uh, nope, second to last question. Um, asking from Tanya, do you have any references about seeding success? Uh, yeah, again, um, 
There are a few papers that have looked at seeding techniques and looked at their success, particularly on this green gravel technique. And I can put links to those papers in the chat or, or if Tanya or whoever emails me directly, I can point them in the right direction. That's great, thank you. And now finally, this is our last question uh, that I can see has, that has come in. So it's from Brody, and they're asking, what is your opinion on kelp restoration work? Is there much hope if the climate models predict further warming? Should we be focusing on, more on resources, on filling research gaps in order to improve management strategies? Okay, yeah, <laughs> these questions are good today. Uh, so um, in answer to the first bit, it really depends on what the driver, the initial driver of kelp loss was. So for example, if it's if it historically was reduced water quality, which was the case in Sydney and around the Sydney coastline, for example, but then the water quality has actually improved and is now in favorable conditions for the kelps, but there are no source populations left to reseed that area, then kelp um, restoration and rewilding is a really, potentially a really effective way uh, of allowing those, those habitats to return. And there's been some fantastic work done primarily around Sydney where they've actually managed to, 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 to restore lots of seaweed beds as the seawater uh, has become higher in quality. If, if on the other hand the driver of loss is uh, increased temperature and at the range edge for example the, the environment is no longer um, feasible for that particular species then obviously unless we can find thermotolerant strains which again people are looking into um, then it would be difficult or, or, or challenging to, to, to actively restore the kelp species in that area, which is no longer uh, favorable or even inhabitable. Um, but I should say though, as I said, there are lots of people looking into um, thermal adaptation at the local level and even within populations to see if we can find thermotolerant strains that could potentially be planted out uh, in areas that are no longer suitable for, for other strains or other species. Um, but I'd say that we should do both. We should be looking at rewilding and restoration techniques, uh, whilst also um, looking to fill those other research gaps, which currently hinder management efforts. Um, but of course, we'll all say whatever we work on that we need to do more and we need more money to do whatever. Um, but I think in, in, the, in this case, uh, we do need to be taking a, a multi-pronged approach um, to, to kelp forest conservation and management. Great, thank you so much, Dan. I think that was a really interesting point to end this webinar on. Um, yeah, and I know the plight of always wanting more money to try and figure out more, <laughs> to do more research. Um, so to all our attendees who are still with us, thank you for joining today's MOSS webinar. And thank you, Dan, for being today's presenter. Thanks very much for having me. Thank you. If you're still with us and um, you liked what you heard today and you want to find out some more about other marine topics, then why not check out next week's uh, MAS webinar presenter, which is Tamara Galloway, and she is presenting Assessing the Impact of Plastics. Um, so again, it's next Wednesday at 1 p.m. UK time. Uh, registration is free. Check out the MAS website to find the registration link there. And also, we are running until the end of May. So if you want to have one every week then you're more than welcome to join us online um, on zoom or on youtube for any of our upcoming mass webinars so all the information that you need is uh, presented on the mass website so um, we hope that you can join us then